Hello friends, Pastor Christopher Manti here with Wings of the Eagle and a special teaching on the rapture. What is it and when does it happen? This is a topic that has divided the body of Christ, unfortunately, quite severely over the past several decades. And it's really not necessary that this division have occurred. So, let's begin. We're going to use the scripture. We're going to let the word of God speak for itself. And we're going to divide it up into three parts. Uh, part one, we're going to answer what exactly is the rapture? Is it real? And what exactly is it? And what is the purpose of it? And then part two, when does it happen? Is it before the tribulation that Jesus talks about? Or maybe it's before the wrath of God? And why does that matter anyway? And finally, part three, we're going to address frequently asked questions and how to address them when they come up in conversation. All right, so let's go with part one of the rapture. What is it? And what is its purpose? Uh, first off, the biblically correct term for the rapture is actually the gathering or the gathering to Christ. Both Jesus and Paul refer to it by that name. It's just a more complete and uh, apt description of what it is. And we're going to see that. And we will also see that, yes, it is a real future event. But there has been so much confusion about what the purpose of it is. And that has led to even more confusion about when it occurs. So I believe once we see what the purpose of it is, then the when it occurs will take care of itself. But yes, it is a real event. Some... Some Christians uh, have gone the completely other direction and says there is no such thing as a rapture. This is all a false teaching and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's not the case. All right, so we're going to go right to the scriptures direct uh, to where this event is found. And if you have studied this before, you will no doubt be familiar with these scriptures. So let's follow what the word of God actually says and will be just fine. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18 says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. So this is about dead people. And I don't want you to be uninformed about this. In other words, you we have to know about it. It's not a, a, a side topic that's not important. It is important. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him, Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. In other words, those who have already died when he comes. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. By God's word, by Lord himself is saying this. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, in other words, those of us who survive, will not precede those, not go before those who have fallen asleep, who have died in Christ. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. You could call that a first resurrection. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air because he comes with the clouds amen and so we shall always be with the Lord therefore comfort one another with these words so first we should notice this is a comforting text this is not to disquiet or discomfort or confuse or make you afraid or so discord this is to unite unify pacify and comfort us now, we should know where dead Christians are. And when Jesus comes back, he's coming with them. And if we're one of the 
few that are here on the earth, we're going to be joined together with them. Caught up, it says. Gathered together. Amen. Now, in your Bible, there will be a chapter break after that verse, but it's really the same thought. So let's continue. So let's do that. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. But concerning the times and seasons, in other words, when this event happens, I have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as a labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. They should know these because Jesus used these terms. Thief in the night, the labor pains coming beforehand, peace and safety before the destruction. That's why it's called coming like a thief in the night, in the night because the majority of the people will be saying this is peace and safety. And there's no reason the day of the Lord is either already happened or it's not coming or it's a while off. It's going to surprise them. But it's not supposed to surprise us as believers. You, But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Isn't that what Jesus said? If he came in the... You, know, you would, If he knew what the hour was when he was coming, he wouldn't allow his house to be broken into. It's not going to overtake you like a thief in the night. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. In other words, spiritually. But let us watch and be sober. So if you're not watching for the day of the Lord, that means you're asleep. That's a big deal. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore comfort one another, each other, and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Once again, it ends with an exhortation to comfort. Because we should know these things. Be comforted by it. Live together. Whether we are alive or dead, whether we are dead in Christ and we died before he comes back or we're still alive when he does, we're going to be together. Amen. Now, key to this is, when he says you should know, you I don't have a reason to write to you, you should already know perfectly well that the day of the Lord, this and that. Because he's quoting from the Old Testament. Not just, Jesus spoke about this, yes, but also Daniel the prophet. Paul was quoting Daniel chapter 12. Let's read that. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation of Israel, even to that time. And at that time, your people, Israel, shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So shining brightly as light. Didn't we just read that in Paul? Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Whether you sleep or awake, that means whether you're dead or alive, the dead shall come to life. Watch and be sober. You are not in darkness. You are sons of light and sons of the day. Those who are wise, the brightness of the firmament, like the stars forever, bright, shining, light. Everlasting life, that means immortality, and it will never die. It's a resurrection. After this time of trouble, there's a great deliverance and a resurrection. That's what Paul is quoting from. That's why he's telling them, you should already know this. The time of trouble is going to overtake these ones who aren't watching. They're not going to know that the day of the Lord is coming next.
All right, let's continue with Paul's teaching on this in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, we're only going to cover the end of this chapter, but I suggest you read the whole thing, basically, from uh, verse 12 on to the end, because it's all about the body, our flesh body that dies and our immortal spiritual body, the resurrection body that's given to us when the Lord comes. So let's read the end of that chapter. Now, I say this, brethren, again, calling them brethren, each of these is prefaced by that interesting that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? When Jesus rules in the earth, that's the millennium? Maybe. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Corruption is something that dies, can degrade, can um, get sick. Incorruption can't. Behold, I tell you a mystery. I'm revealing to you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Whether we have died or haven't yet, we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. We are all changed at this last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You can't put it any clearer than that. He's saying what it is. He's saying even at what point we should be looking at for it to occur. For this corruptible body must put on incorruption. An incorruptible body. This mortal body must put on immortality. Doesn't die. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal put on in immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, or Sheol, the grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Number one, he's saying this defeat of death thing hasn't happened yet. Well, clearly it hasn't. Because we're still dying. Christians are still dying. Even though we believe in Jesus, he says, you're going to live if you believe in me, but yet we're dying every day. So there's something coming in the future, at which point we shall never die again. Then it will be brought to pass, right? When this last trumpet occurs, when the dead are raised incorruptible and we who are alive are changed to be in those same resurrected bodies. But he's exhorting you at the end, there's something to be steadfast, he says, to be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, performing labor, and you know it's not in vain because there's apparently something before this change comes, before this defeat of death, finally, before this uh, incorruptible body is given to us, that we must be steadfast, we can't be moved, we're going to have to know that what we're doing for the Lord is not for nothing. So what have we seen so far in these four scriptures that we've covered? All of them so far indicate the rapture or the gathering to Christ is always linked to our promised resurrection. Every single one talks about it. 1 Thessalonians uh, 4 and 5, 1 Corinthians 15 and Daniel all talk about it. It's a link to our promised resurrection. So being that that's the case, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 20 because there is more clues here. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again till the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Who are these talking about? 
beheaded for their witness to Jesus, but it's at a very specific time. During the Great Tribulation is when they are killed. Because it says they had not worshipped the beast or his image, not received his mark. And then they came to life and reigned for a thousand years with Jesus. So, right now, at this recording in 2019 or 2020, the beast has not arrived. His image is not here. The mark of the beast is not here. So this is saying the first resurrection, those included in the first resurrection, are killed during the Great Tribulation. First, I'm not trying to make you feel bad here, but what does first mean? It means first. It means nothing before that. Prime. Alpha. Can't have anything before the first. I am the first and the last, Jesus would say. Well, yeah, but I'm before you. What? <laughs> not possible. So this is the first resurrection. The first resurrection includes those in the Great Tribulation. And by the way, didn't Daniel 12 just say this? There's some who would rise to everlasting life, and some would rise to shame and contempt. The rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished, the end of them. And there's such a thing as the second death, apparently. What's the first death? Death of our body. Our flesh bodies that grow old, get sick, and die. If you have a resurrected body, they can't die, just like Paul was teaching. You're never going to die, so the second death has no power over you. You're done dying. <laughs> That's it. Amen. And so these are the ones who reign with him a thousand years. And we're told, Paul already said, those when Jesus comes, he's bringing all the dead with him. The dead in Christ, they're coming with him. On the clouds. So those are also part of the priests that reign with him for a thousand years. All the dead in Christ. Plus those of us who are still here. Now take a look at this. We talked about those being beheaded for their witness during the tribulation, but read this in Revelation 6. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Not the bodies, the souls. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord? holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest just a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. The Lord is telling them, wait, just one more small period of time, because the final martyrs, just like your martyrs, we've got more. When that number is completed, then I will come and avenge myself, avenge you and myself, on the enemies. Those who dwell on the earth, notice it says dwell on the earth. That means Jesus is coming to the earth to get vengeance. Comes in war comes to avenge his people, the martyrs. I believe these are from all time. I believe these are from the whole history of the church because they're the souls waiting in heaven. Now, let's look at another picture of another group with white robes in heaven. Revelation 7, 9 through 14. After these things I looked, behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, from all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne of the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed? in white robes, and where did they come from? And I, John, said, I don't know. Sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. 
and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. To come out of the Great Tribulation means you have to be in the Great Tribulation. Again, makes sense. It doesn't say they escaped before the Great Tribulation began. It doesn't say they were martyred before the Great Tribulation. It says they came out of it. The only way out of it is to die. Because they have white robes. They were the martyrs. Washed them white in the blood of the Lamb. So they did something. They washed their robes. They became pure. And there's a whole bunch of them. A whole bunch. Could these be the ones that the Lord was telling these folks to wait for? So as we saw from those three passages in Revelation, the first resurrection includes all Christian martyrs who were killed during the Great Tribulation. It says that specifically in Revelation 20. You can't get around it. There are no martyrs after that because they came back to life and they reigned with Jesus for a thousand years. Tribulation is over. Important to remember. Let's take a look at one more scripture and one more book of scripture. That's the Gospel of John. Usually we don't look at this book for end times things. For rapture verses. That's, you know, Matthew, Mark, maybe Luke, maybe, you know, Paul's letters or Revelation. Let's look at John. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. A resurrection at the last day. This is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. John 3.16 and I will raise him up at the last day. Just like Paul would say, if you're in Christ, you're coming. You'll be raised, given new bodies, a resurrected body when he returns. And you're coming with him, by the way. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's John chapter 6, 39 through 40, 44 and 54. Pretty clear from Jesus when the resurrection happens of Christians. John 11 also touches on this. This is when Lazarus has died and of course Martha, his sister, is very upset and Jesus comes to her. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. That's the great promise of Christianity. We will live forever. Even though we die in our flesh, we will be given a new life, a new body. Not just a soul in heaven, but a body to reign on the earth with. The resurrection at the last day. Like we said before, what does first mean? Well, what does last mean? So, from these scriptures so far, I think we can answer pretty clearly, what is the rapture? It's our gathering to Christ at his coming. If we're living or dead, if we're believers, we are gathered to him when he comes. Whether we've already died or still alive, this brings us all to the same place in the clouds, right? Because he comes with clouds and he's coming to the earth to avenge the blood of the martyrs and defend Israel. That is the rapture. What's its purpose? Again, to meet Jesus as he comes from heaven and be given resurrection bodies. Now think about this. We don't need resurrected bodies in heaven because we saw the souls of those who were killed for Jesus 
crying out saying, how long until you avenge us on the earth? So if you're dying, if you're a dead Christian, like I've laid others to rest. You know, I said a funeral recently for a brother in Christ. Um, there We believe they're with him, absent with the body, present with the Lord. Their souls are in heaven with the Lord now, but their resurrection body has not been given to anyone. That's at his coming. If, if, if God wants you in heaven, you don't need a body for that. You just die. Your soul goes to him. That's what we believe. That's scripture. The rapture, what's the purpose? It's for our eternal life on the earth. That's the purpose. And that is part one of the rapture. Coming up in part two, we will discuss when this all happens and answer those. <laughs>